Luke chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 67. And Lord willing, we will complete the chapter this morning. It's a long chapter. It's taken us a little bit, but it's been a, it's a wonderful chapter. It's filled with so many good things. And Jesus hasn't even come in the scene yet. All right? So it kind of sets us up for that. Is the mic too loud out there? Or is it okay? You're good. It's good? Okay. Just... All right, Luke chapter 1, verse 67. And his father, that's talking about, remember John the Baptist was just born to Elizabeth. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all days. And you, my child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in his spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance. Please pray with me as we get our hearts ready to hear God's word. Lord, we pray that just as you did for Zechariah, that you would do so this morning, that you would fill us with your spirit. We have no hope apart from your spirit. Apart from your spirit, we are nothing but captives and slaves of our own desires, led astray, hating one another and hating each other. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us by the washing of regeneration that's only possible through the Spirit that's been given to us by Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. As I thought about this passage this morning, and it really didn't come to me until last night, how do we, how do we make sense of this in light of the whole theme, right? So the theme that I'm trying to point us in the Gospel of Luke is this idea of discipleship. That we were walking in the steps of Jesus, learning to live like Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Because remember, sometimes we get caught up with that fancy word discipleship, but really it just means to be like your teacher. That's what discipleship is. It means to learn from somebody and to be like them. And so it's to walk in the steps of Jesus. And one of the things that stood out to me in this passage, and I want to give a disclaimer here, we, there's so much stuff here that we will not be able to cover everything. This is why our Wednesdays are so important, because we get to dive into a bit more. But notice with me, verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and so he did what? He prophesied. And I think what we see here is going to be a constant theme throughout the Gospel of Luke, is that Jesus' people are called to be spirit-filled prophets. I want to let that resonate for a little bit. Spirit-filled prophets. That Jesus' people, every single one of them, are called to be spirit-filled prophets. And remember, if he calls us to something, it's because he's going to equip us to do that. Now, this is a really important passage because, like many of you, when I hear prophets, 
I oftentimes think of those crazy people that talk about the future, right? And there's been plenty of them, and there still are plenty of them, that claim to have received a word from God and stand on the street corner saying, the world is going to end, this, this, and that, and they think that that's what prophecy is. And we say those are just crazy people, right? Because they're not real prophets. In fact, although sometimes in the Bible the prophets do speak about the future, the primary function of the prophet is not to speak about the future. The primary function of the prophet is to do exactly what Zechariah is doing here. Which is, we're going to see, it splits into two pieces. Verses 60, 68 to 75. Spirit-filled prophets exalt the Lord. That's what they do. They say, look who God is. Look what he has done. That's what prophets do. They exalt the Lord. And the second half of what it means to be a prophet is what he does after verse 76 to verse 79, which is then they exhort God's people to live a certain way. Here's who God is, here's what he has done, and here's who he calls you to be, and here's what you should be doing. That's the task of a prophet. That's what Jesus has called you and I to do, to be spirit-filled prophets in this world. Not saying, not babbling around, saying gibberish and foaming at the mouth, talking about, you know, when the world's going to end. That's not what we see in the Bible. It's this genuine, bold proclamation of who God is, what He is doing, and what the people should do about it. That's where He needs to be a prophet. And that's what He calls you and I to do. But before we get to anywhere, how is it that Zechariah is able to prophesy in this way? Is it because he's really wise and really smart and did all his homework? Is it because he's really good looking and really strong? And is it because he's really popular? What is it that leads Zechariah to be able to do this? He's filled with the Spirit of God. And before we go anywhere, we have to understand this. That the only way that you and I can please God and do what he calls us to do is if he changes us from the inside out right. and fills us with something other than what is in on the inside. Because I don't know about you, but what's normally filled inside of me is not very bueno, right? It's not very good. In fact, if I were to take my thoughts and project them on the screen, the thoughts that sometimes come to me you, many of you wouldn't want to talk to me anymore. And you might be looking, wow, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> but the truth is, if we were to do that with your thoughts, the same would be true. That's right. That if we were to take the thoughts of your heart, the decisions that come in, and po po post them on the screen, that you would run out of here in shame. Because the things that are within us are no good. They are no good. We need something from the outside to change us. And what the Bible says is that something is the Spirit of God itself. The world says, well, no, no, no. You just need better education. You just need to go to a better school. Let's change that curriculum because it's obviously not working. So every other year we spend hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars changing the common core because that's what's going to lead people. Because there's obviously something wrong. But that hasn't worked. Oh, see, the problem is people are just living in poverty. If we could just get them the correct and right financial stability, they would be okay. And yet we look at those who have financial stability and popularity and fame, and they're killing themselves. Because it's obviously not working. Listen to the music of our days. Listen to the lyrics that they're singing. They're crying out for help. And you go listen to the interviews of people who have committed crazy crimes like mass murder, and they all say that they have these terrible thoughts on the inside that take over and they just can't do anything about it. 
Because we have this deep, deep darkness within. And the religions of the world say, you just need to zone out. You just need to find the light within. Look within yourself. But let's be honest. When we look within ourselves, what we find is nothing but darkness. Nothing but darkness. That's why in all those religions there is the teaching of reincarnation because they know that the light within is never good enough. And you have to hope for another opportunity to increase a little bit more in the next life. And the Bible teaches that exactly the light within you is no light at all. It's nothing but darkness. And you need something from the outside to help you. I've heard an analogy one time that we often, many religions picture the human struggle as us struggling up a mountain, trying to climb up the mountain to reach the pinnacle of divinity, whatever that might be, whether it's nirvana, whether it's enlightenment, whether it's this eternal life, life with the gods, or just a life of Zen, and we're climbing up the mountain to reach the top of this religious world. Bible says, yeah, God's at the top of the mountain. That's kind of similar. And yeah, we're at the bottom of the mountain. Yeah, so that's similar to our religions. And yeah, we need to get to the top where God is. But the only problem is that you and I, here's what the Bible teaches, you and I are at the bottom of the mountain, not crippled, not foolish, not mistaken, but dead. And we need to get to the top of the mountain. We need to get to God. But we can't. And so what does the Bible teach? God does what? Mocks us. Try a little harder, you cadaver. He pokes us. He does what? He comes down the mountain. In the person of Jesus, he comes down the mountain and meets us in our darkness and says, follow me. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. But I'm paralyzed, I'm crippled, I'm dead. Just listen to my voice, and in the voice there is life. And this is exactly what Zechariah is being led to proclaim. Because the Spirit of God is the one that's actually speaking. It's not Zechariah himself. That our only hope is found in something from the outside. Someone who is not affected and impacted and contaminated by the darkness that cripples us. And that something and that someone is none other than God himself. And this is exactly what we see Zechariah Proclaiming as he exalts God. He says, look at who God is. Look what he has done. Read with me verse 68. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has done what? He has visited. Think about that for a second. What kind of God is this? A God who visits. A God who makes his appearance known. A God who comes to us. And Zechariah is saying, our God is a living God. A personal God who comes to us. Oftentimes the depictions of the gods that people serve. You know, by the way, just because we say one nation under God doesn't mean that we all mean the same thing by God. Right? I hope you know that. There are plenty of people doing the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> plenty of people driving with North Carolina license plates that say one nation under God, bring before God we trust. But their depiction of God is very different. See, many people think of God as a being, if he is a being, in a land far, far away. Sure, he might have started things, and sure, he might be powerful, but as far as we're concerned, and as far as we know, he doesn't really impact life. He's kind of like a watchmaker. He winds up the watch and lets and places it, and the watch spins, and he steps away. And this is a God that's not concerned with the world. But that's not the God of the Bible. A God that just steps back and lets things happen. The God of the Bible is a living God who visits his people, who redeems his people, who takes them out of slavery. That's what redemption means. And the question we ought to be asking, slavery from what? Hmm, let's keep reading. How is he doing this? How is he going to redeem? Verse 69. 
He has raised up a horn of salvation. The image of horn there was often an image in the ancient world depicting power, and kings, and kingdoms, and rulers who, the bigger the horn, the stronger he is. So you think of, for example, a ram, right? A ram with a really large horn is typically considered a stronger ram. So the, the symbol of horn was often used to refer to kings. And so God is redeeming his people. He's removing them from slavery. We don't know what the slavery is yet. And he is doing so by raising up this king, some king, who's bringing salvation for us. Salvation from what? And this king is in the house of his servant, David. In other words, this is someone who's coming from the family line of King David. In other words, not just God isn't just a living God, but he's a God who is faithful to his promises. The whole reason he speaks about him being from the house of David is because this was spoken of long, long ago. Long before Jesus came in the scene, long before Zechariah came in the scene, that one day a son from the lineage of David would come and defeat the enemy. And everybody thought, maybe Solomon. Solomon's going to do it. And Solomon was full of wisdom and riches and wealth. But then he eventually loses to the great enemy. What is that enemy? Find out, because this king here is not going to lose to the enemy. Notice verse 70, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of those who hate us, to show mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our fathers, Abraham, to grant to us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might be able to serve him without fear. Notice this repetition of the idea of enemies. We ought to be asking, who are these enemies? Who is this enemy that we need deliverance from? Again, if you were to walk around the streets and just ask people, hey, what's wrong with the world? Like, why do people keep killing each other and stealing each other and lying? Like, why is that? Why, is there, why are there terrorists? Why are there wars? Why are there diseases? Why are there sicknesses? Why is there death? And you just ask people in the streets, what do you think they're going to say? What might be some things that they might say? Right? Because there's evil people out there. You know? I mean, some people are just liars. They're just bad people. We just need to get rid of them, put them in a prison, send them away. Those people over there on the other side of the train tracks, those are the bad ones. Well, others might say, well, you see, there's something wrong in the world because there's systemic racism and it's causing all the problems in our society and these stupid politicians can't make up their minds to actually do something good and we need, some, we need a leader, a political leader who's going to just legislate something decent for once. And that's our problem. Because we don't have qualified people sitting in the right seats, making the decisions for our land. Let's suppose we get the best leader. A person who actually chooses what's right all the time. Let's imagine that for a second. And let's imagine we take all the evil people and we send them over there and we create a really big wall around us, the good people. And we get a really wise person to lead us. Will that solve the problem? Why is it that every dream of utopia doesn't work? Because where is the true problem? In me. And in you. And eventually that wise leader, if he doesn't disappoint you, or if she doesn't disappoint you, will eventually lose to the greatest enemy that has conquered everybody. And that's the enemy called death. Everyone loses except for this king, who apparently is going to save us from that enemy. Listen to what Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to turn to follow along, you can. But listen to how Paul describes Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He describes the human struggle in a way that's very different from what we hear in the narratives played on the movies and in the screens of our culture. Very different. 
The narratives are culture that puts the blame out there on those people, on that person, on that guy, on that lady, on that systemic problem. Listen to what Paul says. And you, talking to me, talking to you, and he's even talking about himself. You were dead in trespasses or sins. What's the real problem here? Sin. This darkness within, not things, right? Well, oftentimes we think of sin like, okay, I lied. That's a sin. I need to stop lying. Or I stole. That's a sin. I need to stop. Those are fruit of something much deeper. The reason we steal, the reason we lie, the reason we blame, the reason we make excuses rather than only up, the reason these things happen is because of a deeper root called a sinful heart. And notice what he says. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You walked in this. But don't worry, you're not the only one. You are following the course of this world. You are following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul is saying, you want to know what's wrong with society? It's that everybody's heart is led astray. And they're being led astray by this power. The spirit that's leading everybody astray. And he doesn't name them here, but we name them. His name is Satan. This evil mastermind that's behind all the evil masterminds, that's behind all the corruption, that's behind all things, instilling within us a fear of death that causes us to do stuff we normally wouldn't because we're afraid of dying, and a fear of losing our pride and a, a desire for the things that are hurtful for us. And he taunts us and he makes us give in to the desire of the flesh. Notice what he says in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. In the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of man. Oftentimes, people misunderstand the message of the Bible and they say, yeah, these Christians are such bigots. I mean, they just want to call everybody else out for their sin. Are you hearing what Paul's saying? He's not saying the problems with them. He's saying the problems with me. I used to follow the spirit and the power of the darkness. I used to be led astray by my desires. Genuine Christianity is not a putting the blame on the problem over there. It's an acknowledgement that the problem is in me. And anything other than that, even if they call themselves Christians, don't listen to them. Because what's wrong with this world is me. That's what's wrong with the world. And so he gives us a very dark image here. That all of humanity is corrupted and it begins with me. But look at verse 4. And children, I know your parents tell you not to go around saying the word but. But the Bible has some really big buts. And the buts in the Bible, the buts in the Bible are the most important buts of all. And this is the one time where it's okay for you to say that you like big buts. Okay? Children, and that you cannot lie to them. This is the one time. But, verse 4. All of humanity, including me, including everybody, is led astray by their evil desires and this power of sin that's inspired by this evil mastermind called Satan. Verse 4. But. But. It's not over yet. But. God. Being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. Not because you're not that bad not because you did something to deserve but because of his richness and mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins did what made us alive together with Christ 
By grace you have been saved. Not by something you did. Not because you're okay. Not because you're not that bad. But by grace. And verse 6, and not just that, he didn't just give us life. He raises us up with him and he seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As far as the eyes of God are concerned, you and I are right now with Jesus. You and I, if we have the Spirit of God, could never be closer to God than we are right now. The problem is that sometimes we forget and we allow things to distract us. But there is nothing you and I can do to earn a closer seat to the table. You can't. You are already seated at the right hand of God. And oftentimes we keep trying to put it back on us. And Paul's saying, no, no. It's none of you. It's because of God's great love. Because of the big butts. Verse 7. And what's the purpose in this? So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable richness of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In other words, God has done this. You might ask, well, why is He doing that to me? Like, I, I, am, I deserve nothing. I do nothing but screw up. What's in it? What's the catch? Well, here's the catch. God takes something broken like this. And he gives it new life. Why? So that he might use you and me as a trophy of his mercy. So he might display you and me to the whole watching world, especially to the dark powers that have tried to defeat God's purposes. He might take you and me and he might display it as a trophy. Look around, guys. Look around. Them. This one right here used to be addicted to drugs. This one over here used to be an alcoholic, couldn't live a day without it. This one over here used to be addicted to pornography. This one over here used to be all sorts of things. This one over here used to be an adulteress. This one over here used to be a murderer. And now look at him. Look at her. Not to display our goodness, not to display our greatness, but his grace. Listen, verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of your works. So that nobody might boast. For we are His workmanship. We are His creation. Created in Christ Jesus to sit around for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. God takes broken vessels, broken people, and restores them. And this is exactly what back in Luke chapter 1 we see Zechariah talking about. That this living God, this faithful God, this mighty God is a merciful God that takes losers like you and me and chooses to use them for his purpose. Listen back to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 verse 74. Why is God doing this? Verse 74, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might do what? Serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all of our days. Only on Sunday mornings? Only Wednesday nights? All of our days? Only some of the time? Only when we feel worthy? Only when we feel up to it? No, all of our days. Because the serving, the ability to do it doesn't reside in me, but resides in him. And so Zechariah is led by the Spirit to proclaim, here's who God is, here's what he has done. I hope somebody's listening. He is the living God who visits. He's the faithful God who keeps his promises. He's the mighty God who can defeat the one enemy that no one else can defeat. No one else can defeat. And God can do it. And he's the merciful God who's willing to use you and me despite our weaknesses because he's not interested in the things that you have. He's interested in you. He wants you. He wants you in his presence. He wants you at his table. In the same way that a father 
doesn't care about the things that the son or daughter have to give them. They just want the son and daughter sitting next to them. That's all they want. And a son and daughter that trust in holiness and righteousness before him all the days. So if you are somebody who this is new to you, then that means you need to begin at step one of what Zechariah says and what Paul says that we need to turn. We need to confess. We need to repent. We need to ask God's mercy. He said, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Fill me with this spirit that I hear about that can change hearts. That's where you need to start. But if you're somebody who has the spirit and you know that God has changed your life, then it's time for us to grow up and put on big boy pants and start serving. Start doing something. Walking in the good works. And don't fall for the trap of thinking that that serving needs to happen inside these four walls. No. The purpose of these four walls is to equip you, and to train you, to go and do the real ministry. And so where do we begin? And this is the second purpose of the prophet. He doesn't just exalt God, but he exhorts his people, God's people. Notice what Zechariah does next, verse 78. 76. He does this amazing prophecy regarding who God is and what God has done. And oftentimes you and I would stop right there, right? Sing these wonderful songs, read the Bible, pray. Oh, this is sing kumbaya. This is wonderful. Let's go back home. No, but that has a purpose. It's like planting a tree. You plant a tree not just so that you can say you have a tree, but so that the tree can produce something. Where is this something? Where do we begin? Notice what Zechariah does. Where does he begin? He turns to his newborn son and he begins there. He has just finished saying, here's who God is. Here's who God has done. And now he turns to his son and he says, my son, here's who you are going to be. Here's who God's calling you to be. And here's what you're going to do. We cannot underestimate or overestimate the power of a father or a mother speaking into the child's life. This world is going to teach us that you as parents or grandparents should just let your children be. Let them find out for themselves who they are. That's a lie. Because they only want you to back away so that they can step in and tell the child what that child should be. But notice what Zachariah does. You, my child, I'm not going to let the world decide who you're going to be. You will be called a prophet of the Most High. We as parents, as grandparents, as uncles and aunts, as prophets of God need to look at the next generation and say, you are his. You, my child, belong to him. That's your identity. Don't listen to the world. You don't get to pick. He made you. You belong to him. And too many parents are a bunch of sissies letting their children pick for themselves. And that needs to stop. And a bunch of grandparents just waving their hand, step in and say, you don't belong to yourself. You are not your own. You belong to God. Your life has a purpose. Imagine how different our community would be if parents actually did that, if grandparents actually did that. And children didn't have to go to a cell phone or a YouTube or a video game to figure out who they are. If they could grow up having parents and other people in the community from day one speaking, you are going to be a prophet of the Lord. That's why we do the baby dedications. Because we want from day one that child to know you exist in this world not for yourself. The world doesn't exist you. You are a prophet of God. You belong to Him. And we are letting too many children get away without hearing that. Within a five mile radius from here, a 10 mile radius from here, there are dozens and dozens of children that have never, never heard anything about the Bible. We are growing up, we are living in a secular culture in which the majority of people are now not knowing anything about God. Because from day one, what do parents do? Oh, I can't stand that crying. Here, here's a scream. Oh, I can't stand it so no. Here's a tablet. Oh, here's YouTube. Here, you take it. Here's, here's all the freedom you want as long as I have peace and quiet. Imagine if a gardener did that. Never have any fruit. And then we wonder. And then we wonder and complain why our kids turn you away. Maybe because we've worried too much about the first half and knowing God 
and we don't, don't actually get busy telling other people about him. But a prophet must exalt God. We can't stop there. A prophet must also exhort the people. And we must go beginning in our home and in our community and in our friends and telling people, you belong to God. And until you realize that, my son, my daughter, my friend, my co-worker, whatever, you will be miserable. I hate to tell you that, but you will. You will be miserable now and you will be miserable later because you belong to him. You are meant to be his servant. Look at what he says to, to John. He says, you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his way, not your way, John. This isn't about you. You're not John Wayne. It's not about your way. You're not Sinatra. This is the Lord's way. Your life exists for him to give the knowledge of salvation to his people. You are his messenger. To give the knowledge of salvation to his people. And what's the summary of this knowledge? The forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. That you and I ought to be following Zechariah's example as we exalt God in his mercy and as we train up the next generation Encourage them, my son, my daughter, my friend, my cobra, my whoever. You belong to God, and you have been given a purpose to tell people about His mercy, at least the forgiveness of sins. The one thing that's enslaving everybody, God is willing to say, boom, I can take it away. And we oftentimes are so worried about just trivial things. When the real problem is sin. And God is willing to forgive. And He's given that message to you and to me. And there's a world that needs to hear it. <clears throat> because of the tender mercy of our God, verse 78, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. <clears throat> In other words, there's this, this darkness that is over the land, but there's the sun that's rising. Some translations say the sunrise will, will rise will visit us. Some say it has already visited us. And the, the, the confusion there, I think, comes because from Zechariah's point of view, Jesus hadn't been born yet, right? But from Luke's point of view, when he's writing this, Jesus has already been born yet. And so, has already been born. And so, the sunrise, from our perspective, has risen. Jesus has come. But from Zechariah's point, he hadn't come yet. Does that make sense? But notice, he will rise up and visit us from our on high, to do what? To give light to those who sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. There are people out there sitting in darkness. And you children will be the ones who tell them about the light. And if you don't tell them, they might never hear. There are people out there in the shadow of death, on the brink of suicide, on the brink of depression and anxiety, on the brink of giving up. And they need to hear about the sunrise that's coming and bringing hope. And many of them don't hear. And you children are going to be the ones telling them. I was telling my kids the other day, when they are my age and most of their friends will never have heard anything about the Bible. And they are going to be the ones who are going to tell them. And the same goes for all of us in here. There is a land of darkness and this light has come. There is a land filled with the power of death and this hope has come. And there is a land filled with despair and peace has come. And this, this child, this king that Zechariah and John are called to point to, who we are going to read about next week, the Son King, this Child King, Jesus, is the one who brings all of this. Who brings the light into the darkness, life into death, peace in the midst of despair. And that our purpose in life is to be the ones who point others to Him. Whether it's through our food pantry, whether it's through our essential bags, whether it's through going to a nursing home, or whether it's going uh, to different things, to the love life. To take all these opportunities to tell the world. So my prayer is that we will realize this. 
Now we serve a living God who is faithful, who is mighty, who is merciful, and He calls us to be His servants, His messengers, His vessels in this world. And we are then to take this and speak into the next generation's life, like Zechariah did. Amen. And there are many things going to try to distract you. That's why we must not forsake the gathering. Right? Because as we gather, we remind one another, we stir up one another to remember who our God is and who we are called to be. <clears throat> Amen? Amen. If you have any comments or questions or anything you would like to discuss further, uh, please come talk to me afterwards or save it for Wednesday if you would like to. But as we, we're about to pray and then we'll sing one more song as we close this morning's service. Let's pray. Lord. Our God and our Father, we give you thanks because there is no one like you, merciful, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding steadfast love, showing righteousness and justice to generations upon generations of those who trust in you. Not because of what we have done, not of our own works, not of our goodness, but because of your great mercy. We pray that you would forgive us for often being so slack and just hiding this to ourselves. Pray that you help us to share it with the next generation, to be like Zechariah, to speak this truth into the next generation's life. We pray that you would be pleased with the little that we have to offer you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.